Hey everyone, Disappointed Giant here. Well, here we are. We've made it to the very end. This 5BC tutorial video will focus on the entirety of Dead Cells' endgame. I'll explain how the game mechanics change at this difficulty, we'll go over some strategies on how to cope with and overcome 5BC, and we'll be showcasing all the spoiler content in the game. 5BC is my personal favorite and is a difficulty I've spent the most time on, so I'm really excited to talk about this. This video is the fourth and final video in my Dead Cells tutorial series. Just like my past videos, this will build on concepts that were introduced in the previous tutorial videos. You can watch this as a standalone, but I recommend checking out my tutorial playlist if you haven't seen the other videos in the series. They have timestamps for each section in their description so you can skip around if you'd like. There will be lots of spoilers in this video, so if you're still making your way to 5BC and don't want to have everything spoiled, then I recommend holding off on watching parts of this one. The first half of the video is going to focus on the gameplay mechanics that have changed and will not show any story spoilers or end game content. If you're curious about what's different and don't mind some mild gameplay spoilers, then it's okay to watch that half. The second half of the video is going to cover all the big spoilers, including a full overview of the 5BC end game content. I've labeled the timestamps in the description with spoiler-free titles to help folks avoid getting accidentally spoiled. Also, in case I haven't said the word enough, there are spoilers and I will be spoiling all the spoils. And with that, we're off. So first things first. The fifth boss cell is dropped by the giant on 4BC, not the Hand of the King, so you'll need to either go through the cavern or through the 2BC door at the end of the Forgotten Sepulchre to reach the giant. After defeating the giant, you'll absorb the fifth boss cell, and at this point, you're ready to roll. Once you get back to the prisoner's quarters, you can crank the difficulty in the tubes all the way to 5 BC. While it may not feel this way at first, the base difficulty and enemy levels of 5 BC are the exact same as 4 BC. Normal enemies have the same amount of health and do the same amount of damage, weapons and biomes have the same quality, and the amount of scrolls and scroll fragments are the same. With the exception of the 5 BC door after the Hand of the King, the biome paths and routing options haven't changed. Enemies still have the ability to teleport and ruin your day, and you'll still get triple the cell drops. This will help you work on completing the S rank at the Legendary Forge while also unlocking any final items or outfits. Speaking of the Forge, since it's apparently my favorite thing to talk about in every single video I make, you'll want to start working on getting the S rank all the way up to 100%. Yes, 10,000 cells is a ton of cells. And yes, you might end up losing some as you're playing since 4 and 5 BC are pretty tough. I, I get it, I really do. Despite the grind and the time it'll take, having all item drops be S rank at this point is really important. The early game of 5BC is generally more difficult than the later parts of your run since it might take some time to get your build online. You'll want to make sure that you have as many S quality items by default as possible so you can minimize the amount of gold you're spending on upgrading the quality of your items. Your gold is better spent on buying new gear as your run goes on or on getting flasks and cough medicine from the food shop. You may be asking yourself, did he just say cough medicine? Yeah, I did. That runny nose and scratchy throat aren't just your allergies acting up. You've been infected by the malaise. The malaise is the cornerstone of 5BC's gameplay and is a new mechanic that can make your runs feel less like a nightmare and more like hell. You may have learned about the story implications of the malaise from the various lore rooms you've come across as you've been playing, or maybe you've eaten a piece of food that was infected by the malaise. What the game doesn't tell you is how much of an influence the malaise will have on your runs. Here's the way it works. When you start a run on 5BC, you'll see a new yellow infection bar above your health bar. This new bar is broken up into 10 sections and as you play, the bar will start to fill up with the malaise. Whenever you kill an enemy, your malaise will decrease by a small amount. Malaise doesn't increase in shops, treasure rooms, or lore rooms. The speed of the malaise built up is dependent on how many enemies are left in the biome. The more enemies there are on the map, the faster the malaise will tick up. Once you kill around 90% of the enemies in the biome, you'll see a message saying that you've cleared the malaise. It will stop increasing and any extra enemy effects from the malaise will also stop. 
Before now, the game didn't impose any kind of speed expectation on the player outside of those optional time doors. But now it's important to think about playing more quickly as you navigate levels and defeat enemies so you can try to mitigate the malaise as best you can. As the malaise bar increases, new gameplay modifiers are implemented. The first section of the bar has no effects, but when you have two bars of malaise, enemies will have less of a delay on their attacks and random enemies will start to spawn around you. At three bars, enemies will teleport to you faster, are more alert, and will occasionally transform into an elite. These modifiers increase a bit for four and five bars, and by the sixth bar, enemies also start doing 20% more damage. If your infection meter completely fills up, enemies will spawn around you about every 10 seconds, have 75% less of an attack delay, are three times as alert, have a quarter of a second delay before teleporting, will transform into elites every minute or so, and do an extra 60% damage. That's a lot. When I mentioned earlier that 4 and 5 BC have the same base difficulty, I said that normal enemies are the same tier and have the same amount of health. This is true, but once the melee starts to creep in, all of that changes and 5 BC becomes a completely new beast. The name of the game is no longer just surviving. Now you need to survive quickly while enemies are continually getting stronger around you. If this sounds awful, well, it kind of is. The good news is that there are a handful of ways to decrease your malaise as you play so you can hopefully keep your runs manageable. The most obvious and important one is to kill enemies quickly to keep the infection from spreading. The way I usually clear is pretty simple. I just play faster than normal and don't waste too much time needlessly running back and forth across the map. I'll take a direct line down each path and will try to navigate each subsection of the level as efficiently as possible. If I miss something along the way, I'll go back for it after Explorer's Instinct pops and the malaise is cleared. If you're already comfortable playing a bit more quickly, then you may realize that your malaise meter doesn't get too full. But if you're a more cautious or paced player, you may start running into some problems. One method of prioritizing malaise removal is to quickly go through the biomes and kill as many enemies as you can without stopping for items or shortcuts along the way. Like I mentioned earlier, the malaise doesn't increase when you're in shops or item rooms, so it won't hurt to take those if you see them. It may be beneficial to hold off on stopping for other items though, like weapons hidden above vines or under breakable floors until the malaise is cleared. At that point, you can take your time and go back for anything you missed as you clean up the map and kill off the last 10% of the mobs. While this method does help clear the malaise quickly, it can lead to some sloppy play since you'll need to rush, and runs can go on a little longer than usual since there's more cleanup to do in each biome. I've seen a bunch of folks play this way because it works for them, but I personally don't subscribe to this method due to the extra time I need to take at the end of each biome to clean things up. There are three other ways to lower your malaise. One is to use a health flask, which reduces your malaise by three. Another is to buy cough syrup from a food shop, which also reduces the malaise by three. On 5BC, all food shops have had the small food replaced with cough syrup, so it's readily available. And finally, beating any boss will reduce your infection by five. Using some basic math here, you'll want to make it to the first and second tier bosses with less than half of your malaise bar filled up, so it will go down to or will be close to zero after defeating the boss. So, malaise is kind of a lot. 4 BC can be stressful enough, but now you need to consider time and efficiency in a way that you didn't need to before. In my mid-game tutorial video, I mentioned either routing for food or for scrolls, but on 5 BC, you may want to route for speed instead. While missing an extra scroll fragment or two in a biome isn't something to lose sleep over, going through certain levels on 5 BC may cause some issues. Around the time I was starting to outline the script for this video, I got an email from a subscriber named Joey who asked about what biomes would be best to take in the beginning of 5 BC. This got me thinking about it a little bit more than I originally planned. In my opinion, the worst two levels to go to in 5 BC are the Promenade of the Condemned and the Ossuary, as both of those levels have really long corridors and lots of elevator shafts that don't have any enemies. Their mobs are grouped in clusters around the map with lots of space in between. The time that you spend running through long hallways and empty spaces is time that you're not killing enemies so your malaise will keep increasing. The ossuary does have a food shop though so that might help. 
To a certain extent, the slumbering sanctuary isn't a great place to go either, since that also has long corridors connecting those external areas and you have to go through the main section of that level twice. The sanctuary comes right after Concierge and Conjunctivius though, so you'll get there with lower malaise from the boss kill. My personal dilemma is that the Prom and the Oss are two of my favorite casual levels to play, so if I choose to take those on 5BC, I need to prepare myself for a little bit more trouble than usual. Routing can be pretty subjective, so this is just personal preference, but the path I have the most luck with is taking the sewers to Corrupted Prison and then through the 1BC door to the Ramparts. From there, I cut through the 3BC door to Conjunct, hit up the graveyard, and then go to the Forgotten Sepulchre. If I've gotten bad off-color scrolls, I'll take the cavern instead for an extra scroll or two. Then, it's giant to High Peak Castle or Distillery, and finally off to the 5BC endgame. Even though this path is where I usually lean, I stay flexible and might change course depending on how things go. If I could use an extra scroll early on, I'll take Ancient Sewers instead of Rampart since it has more fragments. If I luck out and get an extra curse or two and a couple of challenge rifts, I'll fight Concierge instead of Conjunct and will run through Stilt Village before the Sepulchre. That route's a bit faster since Concierge is a shorter fight than Conjunct and Stilt is so small and densely packed. All that said, similar to what I've mentioned in my other videos, I advise you to experiment and see what feels best for you. Maybe you take levels you have the most success in so you can find a path that you get comfortable with as you adjust to 5BC. Maybe you try my route to see how it feels. Or maybe you check out the biome map and plot out where you want your run to go based on what levels have the best music. There are some days where I'm just feeling the vibe and I take the quote unquote worst path and rack up a ton of malaise from both the promenade and the ossuary. 5BC is pretty tough, but you can make it yours. One of the ways that you can prepare for 5BC is by going into custom mode and enabling the malaise on lower difficulties. Oddly enough, with this setting, you can play 0 BC with full malaise, so you might as well use this to your advantage as you start building your reps. When the current malaise mechanic was implemented, I had a lot of trouble with it, and I lost an embarrassing amount of 5 BC runs while I was adjusting. If you're finding yourself hitting a wall and you want to take the malaise for a test drive without so much pressure, try playing a lower BC with an enabled and see how things go. Once you're comfortable with it and get accustomed to what changes, you can crank the difficulty back up to 5BC and get after it. The most difficult part of adjusting to the malaise will probably be the random enemy spawns. Fortunately, not every enemy in the game has the ability to spawn, so you'll start to get familiar with which enemies will randomly pop up as your infection grows. A lot of the more troublesome enemies like golem, slammers, and explosive barrels will never spawn, but some tricky ones like bombers and infected workers will. You can check the wiki for a full list of which enemies will not spawn. There are some situations where spawning enemies can quickly cause havoc in a run, like when you're cursed or if you're already in the middle of a battle with double elites. Being aware of the timing of random spawns and knowing what to expect goes a long way. Similarly to how you can use teleporting enemies in 4 and 5 BC to your advantage, you can also benefit from the mechanics of melee spawn mobs. Any enemy that spawns will count towards your kill streak, so if you're in the high 40s or 50s and can spare some extra malaise, you can stay stationary and pick off spawning enemies until you hit 60. I'll do this if I'm close to getting the kill door and have a tough section coming up, or if there's an elite in the middle of the only path I can take. Your malaise will continue to increase as you wait though, so it's a good idea to weigh the longer term risks against the rewards if you choose to try this. Enemies that spawn from the malaise will not randomly drop blueprints on their own, but you can use the hunter's grenade on them. First off, if you don't have the barrel launcher blueprint yet, this is the absolute best way to get that since the infected workers will start spawning when you have at least two ticks of malaise. While I am a distillery apologist, I know a lot of people don't care for it, so doing this will help you avoid the hassle. I'll also use this method to get blueprints from other late game enemies like the Swarm Zombie from the Graveyard, or to get the Desert Dweller outfit from Shieldbearer since for some reason that only drops on 4 or 5 BC. Keeping something useful in your second skill slot is definitely important, but if you're hunting for blueprints, you can grab the Hunter's Grenade in the Prisoner's Quarters, let the malaise build there, and then use it on whatever enemy you're waiting for to get the blueprint. You can cash in the blueprint right after the PQ and will free up your skill slot before going to the second biome. This is another one of my incredibly specific optimization strategies, but if it helps you get some of those harder to find blueprints, then I think it's worth trying out. 
at this point, I think I've covered all of the light spoiler or spoiler free 5BC content. From this point on, everything will be blatantly spoiled and I'll be showing the entirety of the rest of 5BC, so take this as your last chance to stop watching or to bookmark this and come back when you're ready. Something you'll notice during your first 5BC run is that the Collector is no longer in the pathways between biomes. He's replaced by an apprentice who's adorably called Not the Collector. There are no differences with spending cells or unlocking things between the Collector and Not the Collector, so you'll still be able to unlock everything that's available to you. You'll be able to spend cells with the Apprentice after every level in Boss, except after the Astrolab, which is the 5BC exclusive biome. The Astrolab is my absolute favorite biome in the game for a lot of reasons. The soundtrack is fantastic, it's visually striking, and when I go through the level, it truly feels like I'm at the end of a long journey and that everything I've done has been building to that very moment. The level is structured in a way where there are sprawling pathways high in the sky that eventually connect to a tall, trap-filled tower. There are two elite enemies somewhere in the level, and each one of them drops either an Allen key or an elevator key when you kill them. The goal of the lab is to get both keys, reach the tower, and then make your way down the outside of it. Then you can unlock the doors at the bottom and make your way all the way back up on the inside. As you make your descent, you'll be able to see inside the tower and get a sneak peek at the hazards and enemies that await. Once you climb up to the top, you'll find two elite slammers waiting for you in a really small room. You need to kill them both to get the final two keys that will unlock the door to the observatory, which is where the collector is. If you don't want to fight the slammers, you can aggro them and then drop down the elevator shaft. They'll die from either the electricity or the fall. Also, in case you need it, the Astrolab has a guaranteed food shop. Before we talk about the observatory and the final boss, let's go over some of the 5BC exclusive items. There are a handful of new enemies that are specific to the Astrolab, and two of them will drop blueprints. The first one is the Hemorrhage Blueprint, a slow-ranged item that scales with brutality and tactics. This is dropped by the Magistrate of Death enemy. This heavy throwing axe will briefly stun enemies, will inflict bleeding for 3 seconds, and does critical hits on enemies that are either poisoned or bleeding. It's basically the inverse of the Sadist Stiletto. The second blueprint is for the Thunder Shield, which scales with both tactics and survival, and is dropped by the Defenders. This shield is interesting because it has an additional shock base function tied into blocking and parrying. When you parry, you'll give off electricity around you in a small radius for 8 seconds. If you use this shield again during this time, it will discharge and shoot a brief AoE attack that shocks any enemies nearby. You can also hold the shield up to block and shoot lightning from it. This shield is really unique since it not only blocks and parries, but it also gives you ability to shock and stun enemies. The third Astrolab exclusive blueprint is a ranged weapon called the Sonic Carbine, a tactic scaling weapon that's kind of like a magic assault rifle. This one is a bit tricky to get. You may have noticed that when you get to the top of the tower, there's a blueprint tucked away right under the roof. In order to get the blueprint, you need to find an area at the bottom of the map that is, big surprise here, filled with traps. That room contains the Apex Key. My preferred method of getting the key is to clear the map until Explorer's Instinct procs to take the guesswork out of where I need to go. Then, I'll safely drop down to the trap room. There are a couple of safe spots where you can duck under lasers, namely on the second platform and right below the fourth laser. If you have ice armor, you can use that to protect yourself from a hit and can use these two safe spots to wait out the cooldown. The last section is the trickiest since you'll need to descend down an area where there are two vertical lasers, one horizontal laser, and no ground to stand on. Here's where you can grab onto the wall and wait for the right moment to jump across the lava and grab the apex key. Once you have the apex key, you can make your way back to the tower and find the side that does not have any spikes on it. You can run all the way up that side of the tower to make it to the top where there's another trap room. There are some tricky jumps on the way up, but they can all be made with wall runs in your normal double jump. After you unlock the room at the very top of the tower, you'll see a switch. Press it to release the Sonic Carbine Blueprint and then drop back down so you can grab it. Since there are so many traps along this road and it's so late in the game, I highly recommend taking the Masochist Mutation to reduce trap damage and the Disengagement Mutation as a safety buffer just in case something goes wrong along the way. Another Astrolab exclusive is the Librarian. 
These mobs will hover above you while shooting lasers at you. On their own, librarians aren't too bad to deal with, but if there are other enemies in the area, avoiding them and other mobs can be really challenging. Whenever I go to the lab, I take some kind of AoE or ranged item that can be used to kill or stun the librarians. Think along the lines of lacerating aura, giant's whistle, lightning rods, things like that. They have relatively low HP, so a quick burst of damage is usually enough to take them out. Having purely horizontal weapons and skills means you'll need to wait until they attack with their lasers three times before you have a chance to respond. One way that you can avoid their lasers is to run directly into a wall and then continue to run in that direction while they're above you. For some reason, as long as you're pressing towards the wall, they'll continue past it and will shoot their lasers out of reach. This is a great exploit that might save you some HP and some trouble if they get the drop on you. After leaving the Astrolab, you'll make your way to the Observatory to fight the Collector, who is the true 5BC boss and the alchemist that the game has been referring to. You'll give him all of your cells and he'll make the panacea out of it, which is a potion that is fabled to be the cure of all diseases, including the malaise. This causes him to hulk out and leads to my personal favorite boss fight in the entire game. He has several phases with each one taking the fight to another room in the observatory. The first room has him either charging you, slamming down and causing bombs to fall, or spinning around on his syringe. The second room has three mobs appear, and the third will introduce his ranged attacks, including a laser just like the librarians. You'll continue through various other rooms until you reach the final telescope room. Regardless of what phase you're in, all of his attacks are telegraphed and are either avoidable or parryable. As you fight the collector, he'll drink a potion to regain health. He does this three times and will be shielded while he's healing. The fourth time he goes to drink, you can knock the panacea out of his hands and can drink it yourself, which is how you trigger the end of the fight. Drinking the panacea will refill your flasks and give you an absurd amount of extra DPS. From here, it should just take a few extra hits to finish him off and get your first 5BC clear. When you defeat the Collector the first time, you'll get the blueprint for the Collector's Syringe skill, which is commonly referred to as Spin to Win since it trivializes a lot of enemy encounters. The credits will roll and you'll be back in the prisoner's quarters to start a new run. As you start to play, the Timekeeper will show up and pull you into the clock room, but instead of fighting her, she kicks you back into a portal and resets the time loop on the island. Some things will revert back to how they were at the very beginning of the game. Most importantly, the king is back on his throne. In order to clear the time loop, you'll need to beat Hand of the King and use his symmetrical lance to break the shield around the king, just like you did after your first 0 BC clear. This time, instead of using the prompt to kill the king, detach your head and possess the king's body with your homunculus rune. This will turn you into the king, which, as you may have realized by now, is the beheaded's true identity. From here, go through the Astrolab and Observatory again in your new robes, fight the Collector again, and when you're victorious, the game's true ending will play and the time loop will be resolved. Doing this will unlock two outfits, the King outfit, which is free, and the Fallen Collector outfit, which costs a thousand cells. There are a couple of other things I want to mention about the second time you fight the Collector. First off, if you beat him flawlessly at any time from this point forward, you'll get the White King outfit, which has been one of my favorite outfits since it was introduced way back in version 1.7. You can't get this outfit the very first time you beat the Collector, so even if you manage to get a perfect fight on your first trip to the Observatory, it won't unlock. One tactic you can use as you make your way to this special second fight is to build around survival, so when you grab the legendary symmetrical lance from the hand of the king, it will scale properly with your stats. Since this item breaks shields, you can take that into the observatory and unload on the collector even when he has his shield up. Doing this can also get him to drop the panacea earlier than expected. Note that you can only complete the loop once. If you defeat the Collector while wearing the King outfit, the time loop resolves and everything goes back to normal, so if you win this particular fight, you won't have a guaranteed Sim Lance on future runs. This particular Lance also has scrolls attached to it, so picking it up will increase all three of your stats. This is the only remnant of the Scrolls on Weapons feature that's still in the game since that was removed in version 1.9, so whenever I see this, it brings me back to a warm and fuzzy place where Dead Cells existed before it had Boss Rush. Ah, memories.
At this point, I want to go over a couple of my personal strategies for getting a flawless fight against the Collector. First off is my go-to build. I'll run Tactics and get a high-level Tesla Coil and get something like the Sinew Slicer or Double Crossbow Matic for my second skill. Corrupted Power is great here too. I'll take Sonic Carbine as my main weapon and will grab Hakuto's Bow if I can as a secondary to ramp up all of my damage. If I can't find one, I'll just take whatever fits. My mutation choices are all offensive. Barb tips, point blank, in support. Before I fight the boss, I'll reroll whatever items I can to try to get extra synergies. My strategy is pretty straightforward. Throw down the Tesla coil and other turrets or skills, get as close as possible, and just unload with the carbine. You'll still need to know how to avoid the collector's attacks if you try this, but he should only get one full attack in before he has to drink. The carbine has a huge clip, so he'll take a lot of damage from barb tips, even during his shielded state. In my face flash video, I mentioned using a lot of small and quick sources of damage for fast boss kills, and in my opinion, this is the best example of that. With this setup, the collector is constantly taking lots of little damage from multiple sources. One or two turrets, regular damage from the fast carbine shots, the extra point blank bonus, constant ticks from barb tips, and then everything is ramped up an extra 50% or so from the support mutation. That's not even counting possible synergies or if you use corrupted power for even more damage. What often happens with this build is that the collector will drop his flask early since barb tips does some kind of damage overflow or something along those lines during his third drink. You can grab and chug the panacea before he teleports to the telescope room and then fire a few more quick shots to finish him off. This build takes some extra planning and definitely leans pretty heavily into some overpowered items, but it clearly gets the job done. Another strategy I use when trying to get a flawless is to stay away from any items that will slow or interrupt the collector's attack patterns. So I don't take items like Crusher, Root Grenade, Boy's Axe, or Ice Bow. After fighting him so many times, there's a certain attack cadence that I've gotten used to, so any interruption or change in timing can pull me out of my flow and cause me to take a hit. You may find that these items work really well in the fight though, so if you find that they're helpful, then definitely take them with you. I also tend to get more consistent damage and quicker kills with brutality or tactics builds, so if you're running survival, you may notice the fight lasts a little bit longer than usual. Other than that, it's just practice, practice, practice. Getting all the way through the entire game on the hardest difficulty to face a final boss you aren't familiar with can be pretty nerve wracking. The good news is that once you reach the collector once, he'll be available to fight in the training room. The fight is gated behind a 5BC door and is located through a hidden passage in the wall. Spending some time learning his attacks and patterns in a low-pressure situation can take some of the anxiety out of your future trips to the observatory and may lead to more successful wins and that elusive flawless victory. That White King outfit looks pretty cozy, and if you learn the Collector's attacks and keep your cool during the fight, I can guarantee that someday it will be yours. Yes! 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 Oh, that felt so good! Oh my god. Wrecked! <laughs> oh my god, that was so good, man. Here we go. I got my flawless White King outfit unlocked live on stream with my boys. Yo! <laughs>
Hopefully this video and my other tutorials have helped you learn new things and incorporate different strategies into your runs so you can continue to find enjoyment in everything Dead Cells has to offer regardless of what difficulty you play on. The four videos in this tutorial series have been a genuine pleasure to plan out and put together. Through this channel, I've learned a lot about video editing and audio mixing, have found an avenue for me to share some of my music, have talked with other Dead Cells fans from all over the world, and most importantly, have hopefully made a difference. I am incredibly grateful to Motion Twin and Evil Empire for creating such an amazing game, to Yoan Laolin for his timeless and inspirational music, and to all of you for coming along with me on this wild ride. As always, thank you for watching, and good luck out there.